Okay, we can start. Amanda. Yes. Turn on your, turn on your uh, microphone, Amanda. Sorry, welcome everyone to uh, today's talk. So um, before I introduce um, our speakers, just a reminder that next week we have uh, Rick Kenyon uh, speaking. Um, so, and also if you want to ask um, questions during the, the session, um, please feel free to, to type them in the chat and um, either other experts in the audience uh, can answer them um, or if necessary, Alessandra and I are, um, we can interrupt uh, Balland uh, to ask those questions. Um, so that sort of brings me to the, the speaker. So really pleased this week to have um, Balland Virag from Toronto and he'll be speaking about uh, introduction to random plane geometry. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Uh, so I'm going to talk about random plane geometry. And uh, this is based on joint work with several people, but I like to emphasize two of them. Uh, so this area has been kind of a hot topic and it has attracted you know, extremely talented mathematicians. And, and, and uh, Duncan and Sarav are two of them who are uh, currently or, 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 or next year will be on the job market. Uh, so give them some thought. Uh, so what's a random plane geometry? Uh, I'm just going to do the simplest thing. Okay, so you have uh, plane geometry and just modify it in a in a in, in a random way, uh, in the in the in the really the simplest way possible. So let's say that you have z squared, and to each edge you assign length one or two at random, and you can ask how far is uh, how far are two points in the new distance. Um, so one thing you may want to see is how far do you have to go so that the distance uh, has standard deviation sigma. So you can do simulations of that and, and the answer is, is actually sigma cubed. So, so that already tells you that there's going to be something interesting happening here because we're not used to cubes uh, in, in probability. Um, if, you, if you look at um, you know, how, uh, how geodesics look like, so if you go sigma cubed apart and, and how far away geodesics are from straight lines, Euclidean straight lines, uh, the answer is they're going to be of order sigma squared. So you already see scaling of one, two, and three. Uh, and, the, and the last thing is that what you see is that the distribution of the distance is, is, is not Gaussian. Uh, you can already see on this histogram, which one of my colleagues did. Uh, so there, because of that, you already know that there has to be some kind of structure. Right, uh, some interesting structure here, because if, if there wasn't a structure, then we expect a CLT or some Poisson or something something more simple than just some distribution like this. Um, so, so what do we expect? Okay, so so just on the base of the base of this picture, uh, I expect the following. Okay, so you take this distance. So let's say that I pick a direction v zero. Okay, that's that's a direction on the plane. Then then I can find a vector which is in this direction, but maybe different length, and another vector, which is uh, the two of them should form a basis, such that if you look at the scaling window, uh, defined this, this, define this by, by these vectors. Uh, so on the v direction, it's going to be sigma cubed. On the other direction, it's going to be sigma squared size. So it's an asymmetric scaling window. Then you see some geometry there. Okay, And, and what do I mean? So there is a mean of the distance, which is this which is this uh, sigma cubed times t minus s. Um, and then there is a, a noise term. Okay? And the noise term itself is parameterized by two points in the plane, okay? in, in, in that, in that uh, scaling window. And you can think of this noise term itself as a geometry. And, and that's what this talk is going to be about. Uh, the interesting thing is that, you, that this uh, geometry is expected to be universal. So that's the reason that I uh, make this conjecture. In this particular model, this is completely open. So we don't know anything uh, along these lines, but there are certain models, slightly different, where we, where we can prove these things. So one observation is that um, just from this asymptotics, uh, uh, there's a minus sign here, which I explain in, in a second. But, but if you look at minus L, and because D satisfied the triangle inequality, it was a metric, right? Uh, this, this L has to satisfy the triangle inequality as well. The linear term there cancels out. So, 
So, so that just implies this, and, and also it implies that it also has that LPP is zero, the point to itself, the distance is zero. Uh, so these two properties uh, is a kind of relaxation of, of the condition of being a metric. And I'm gonna use metric in this sense. So we forget a bunch of things about the metric, which we don't, don't require. For example, we don't require symmetry, which is actually quite common if you, for example, look at travel times. Uh, we also don't require the, the values to be positive. And, and metrics can also take the value plus infinity. There could be that you can get from one place to another. So, <clears throat> so it's, this is what we call actually a directed metric, but I'm just gonna use a metric during this talk. Um, so you see that there is a one, two, three scaling and this one, two, three, three scaling is characteristic of all these models. And uh, this, this, this uh, you know, world uh, of random geometry is, is in physics is called the Carter parisi jean uh, universality class. And the one, two, three scaling is, is well known in there. Um, one, one more thing is if you, if you go into different directions V0, we don't really expect the, you know, these uh, metrics to interact too much. So you should get independent limits. So you have to go in this, in, plain ge in this geometry, if you look at this very simple kind, you always get this kind of limit, which is only along the one long line. And what I'm gonna talk about is the introduction to this random metric L, which we call the directed landscape. So, so first of all, you know, what does universality mean? Well, you probably all know, know that to just expect that a lot of the model ir irrespective of the, a lot of the models irrespective of their actual details uh, should have uh, the same limit. So it should have an asymptotics like this. So what does it mean that uh, irrespective of their details, what should not matter? Well, of course, the distribution of edge length, for example, should not matter. So you should be able to re replace it by some other distribution and get the same asymptotic. Uh, it also shouldn't matter whether we do discrete or continuous uh, random metrics. So we could just take the plane uh, R squared and put some random uh, random uh, Riemannian metric there uh, with some Poisson process of patches or something like that. And you expect exactly the same be behavior there. Interestingly, it also shouldn't matter whether the metrics are directed or undirected. So you could do it on the directed graphs and you're only allowed directed paths, uh, say going all north uh, northeast or something, then you would still expect the same behavior. Um, once we take directed paths, it actually shouldn't matter whether you take shortest or longest path. When you take longest paths, then these models are called last passage percolation. And uh, that's why, that's where this, these asymptotics are come from originally, and that's why we have a minus sign, right? So, so when we talk about longest paths, we talk about directed metrics with a negative sign. Uh, which you know, satisfy the triangle inequality the other way. But there is no significant difference. It's really just a sign difference. Um, and finally, when you, when you look at directed, in the directed case, you don't necessarily have to look at the longest paths uh, between two points. We could define the distance in terms of some exponential average over all paths, right? Uh, so you exponentiate the length and the average and take the log. And these, uh, these models are called polymer models. And, and, and uh, they have been studied a lot. And then all of these things should, should have this universality class. Now, what should matter, of course, it's important that we're in two dimensions, that's, that's crucial. Um, and you shouldn't really have heavy tails. And the interesting thing is that here, heavy tails probably mean something, uh, you know, anything that doesn't have five moments should be, should be a heavy tail distribution. So uh, this actually makes the area a little bit, uh, quite interesting and, and, and it's, it's, it's very, uh, still lots of open problems about what happens if you don't have these tight moment conditions. Now, another thing is, just like ordinary Euclidean geometry, there are lots of models where you have geometry, it's just not obvious yet that you have them, right? So, so you, geometry is hidden somewhere behind the model, you have to work to, to, to get it out. And the typical one is, is, is particle systems. Uh, one of them is, 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 is STACEP, uh, which I'll talk about later. Uh, if you have, you know, like Tetris, if you look at Tetris and see how that grows, if you don't really play, the surface growth of that uh, would, be, would be one of these. Uh, there's models of the function like the Eden model, and you, know, you know that, there's a random geometry, it's actually, Eden model is actually a ball in the random metric. Um, Schrodinger operators in two dimensions, parabolic Anderson, as you expect that to happen. Let's have this also um, kind of some quench-like deviations in 
random walking random random environment in two dimensions should have this behavior. And the longest increasing subsequence, I'll talk about that as well. And finally, random matrices, it's kind of the most mysterious connection uh, among all, or even though a whole lot is known about it, the, the picture I think is, is really incomplete. Um, okay, so here is a real world example, right? This is a, a path from Thebes, which is one of the uh, original places of the uh, Pythagorean school to, to Athens. And there's a random metric, which is sort of designed by humans and nature somehow. Right? And you see what, 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 what the path, what, what it takes to, to go there. Uh, it raises the question of, you know, how realistic are these, are these models for actual random metrics that we see? And, that, and, and that's actually a really interesting question. I can talk a lot about that later, but you know, we'll, we'll, I'll stick to the, this particular model first. Okay, so um, first of all, let's do an exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I said we're going to have this kind of scaling limit of the metric, right? So let's now uh, not look at the random metric, but an origin, but, but just a, a Euclidean metric and see what happens if you do the same scaling to the Euclidean metric that we expect, that we expect to have from the, this random metric, right? So you just take the ordinary plane uh, Euclidean distance. This is, a, this is a trivial exercise. But I tell you what, what, what the result is. So, so you get the limiting uh, distance, which I call the stretch Euclidean metric. Um, and it's, it's a norm. Okay, so it just, it just depends on the difference of the endpoints. And this is what the norm is. So, wow. So, if, uh, uh, um, so there is a space direction, which is, can be positive or negative. That's why. But there is a time direction, which can only go in one direction. So, so shortest path, uh, they cannot backtrack in the time direction. Um, and uh, the distance is y squared over s. Uh, in, in this norm from zero, if s is positive, it's, it's you know, distance, the norm of zero is zero and otherwise it's plus infinity. Okay, so it's asymmetric, it takes the really plus simplicity, but, but otherwise it's perfectly nice as a norm and pretty much everything you wanna do with norms, you can do with this one as well. Uh, so it's some kind of non-random version of what I'm gonna talk about in a second. So as a directed landscape, this is the uh, this is uh, something that we constructed with with Duncan and and, and Jan Shortman. So it's it's a, again it's a random directed metric, um, which in distribution looks like this stretch Euclidean norm first. Uh, plus there is some noise term. The noise term always has the same distribution, which is a trace uh GUE trace rhythm distribution, and the scaling only depends on the difference of times. It doesn't actually de depend on the spatial difference at all. Of course, all these trace of distributions are, are coupled in an extremely intricate way. So for any two points in the plane, there is a trace of distribution or there is a, a distance of those points. And, 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 for, and this is a four parameter process. It's a perfectly fine metric. It's a continuous function. So you don't have to worry about things like it being a distribution or anything like that. Although, you know, it's, it's not differentiable, but, but it, it's, it's continuous at least. Um, it has a random fractal structure uh, because it's a scaling limit, so you expect it to be scaling variant. And as you see, um, it, 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 it has the one, two, three scaling. So if you stretch things in the time direction by sigma, sigma cubed and the space direction by sigma squared, then you get the original metric times sigma. That's, that's, the, that's the fractal structure. And finally, uh, as you see, there is again a directionality. So this, this metric goes there's a time direction in which you never backtrack. So shortest path never a backtrack. Um, and, and to understand this metric, actually it suffices to understand it for two fixed, fixed times. So let's say time zero and one. Because from, after you do that, you can kind of build up the whole thing using, using uh, some kind of inverse limit procedure, uh, using independence and, and independence increments. Uh, essentially, once you understand this, you can use a, a Levy type construction or a, a Levy time construction, just like Levy's construction of Brownian motion. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about what this uh, two times uh, formula is, LXY. So, so here's what it looks like, by the way. Uh, so so uh, you see, um, these are this, this is actually the same data. One is a contour plot, the other is a 3D plot. Uh, if you, as, as you see, as X and Y goes uh, farther away from each other, then you have this negative parabola coming from the stretch Euclidean metric, right? But if X and Y uh, goes uh, the same way, so if they stay together, 
So x equals y, but they change, or x equals y, but you change x, then you kind of have a stationary process in this direction along the backbone. Locally, uh, this two, two parameter function looks like the sum of two uh, independent Brownian motions, uh, but only locally. And, uh, and if you have ever seen pictures of, of, of uh, contour lines of that, then, then uh, here, is, here, is, uh, uh, here is what it looks like on, on the right hand side. Um, okay, so, so, so what, what do we know about this directed landscape? Well, it's, uh, it's a limit of certain models, last passage percolation models, exponential geometric, some Bernoulli as well, some directed first passage percolation models like uh, Seppelin and Johansson. It's a limit of TSAP also, and again, I'm gonna talk to you more, talk more about, and, and also longest increasing subsequences. And that's gonna be my next story. Um, okay, so, so what are longest increasing subsequences? Well, I think you all know that. You take a random permutation uniformly from all n, n factorials, n factorial permutations, and you look at uh, a longest increasing subsequence in the permutation. For example, in this one, there's more, more than one, but one of them is one, four, six, right? So it's in, in, this, in this specific permutation. And Willem's problem was, how does the length of this behaves, behave? It, uh, Hammersley uh, sort of re realized that this is actually a geometry program, problem, and then used the uh, Kingston uh, ergodic theorem to prove that if you look at the length, and divide by square root of n, there has to be a limit. Okay, and then this limit was uh, two, and it's identified by by Logan and Shep and Rushing and Kurov quite a bit later. Um, finally, uh, you know, in, in 1999, Bagdai and Johansson under, uh, understood the fluctuations. So you could think of this as as you know, proving these geometric statements that I that I showed uh, at, at a single point. Right? So just uh, just a single uh, distance. Um, and, and then this is a trace of rhythm distribution uh, of, of say L00, right? And then finally in 2002, Prio French Pond by studying uh, uh, introduced a parameter into this, into this world uh, or you can introduce a parameter and they showed that actually with, even with one parameter you have convergence to some process uh, which is now a random function of Y. Uh, this is called the ARI process. Um, that's so that's roughly uh, the, the very short, of course, there's a whole lot that I'm missing, but it's just a short history of, of what has been known. So, so let's look at um, what the geometric picture could be for, for permutations. Right? So, so here's what I did. I, 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 I uh, just uh, took a lattice and changed some of the edges to be longer. So in the first column, I changed the second edge and the second column, the first, and then the third column, the fourth just to represent this permutation as some random uh, geometry. Okay, and then I looked at the longest path between the two corners, okay? As it turns out, it's easy to check, if you think about it a little bit, is that the longest path actually corresponds to a longest increasing subsequence. Right? And so, so this uh, subsequence one for six corresponds to this specific red path. And, and by, by, by longest path, I'm really looking at paths that only in this case are directed. So only go uh, to the Northeast. And so that's that's a, a geometric representation of of a, of a <clears throat> random permutations, and Hammersley had a, a very similar one. Um, now, it actually doesn't matter so much whether I, I pick these lengths from a random permutation or I pick them from, uh, say, IID. So let's do that. Let's do, look at the IID uh, lengths. So here is an IID array of Bernoulli, uh, one half uh, random variables. And to that, I can assign random edge length again, and I can look at longest path, right? And this is, this is called the Sapalain and Johansson model because I only, only modified horizontal edges you know, according to some Bernoulli. Um, and um, the vertical edges all have like zero. Um, so let's, let's, let's see how we can study this model. Um, the key, the key thing that allows us to study all of these things is, is the robinson shenstedt knuth correspondence. This is something that goes back to representation theory. Uh, and there are various versions. This particular version that I'm gonna talk about is called the dual RSK. Uh, uh, the, uh, and, and, and there is something called Green theorem, which is, Green's theorem, which, is uh, which is the definition that I'm gonna give you now of RSK. So, so here is how, how, how you, <clears throat> 
how you how you define the RSK. So, so you you, you define k if there are k lines, you define k different functions w1, w2, wk. So in this case, you would have three of them. The first function w1 is just the distance from the corner to a point on the top. Okay, and you vary that point. Okay, so y is the coordinate of the point. Y is y, y tells you where you are in the top here. This is y, and you see what is the distance to that moving point. So that's a function. To define w2, you set up the equation that w1 plus w2 will be a distance, but now you do distance in a different way. We're looking at the maximal length of k paths, okay? In the sense that when you take two paths, then the edges that they share, they only count once, okay? So, so it's a maximal length of two paths. And then this way you define all the, all the kw's. So this is what RSK is, it's, it's very simple. Um, it's actually a neat exercise. I, 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 ch I challenge you to, to do this, to show that these Ws are actually non-decreasing or non-increasing. So W1 is greater than or equal to W2. And so on, the first, first is easy, the second one is not so easy, actually. Um, and this RSK has two incredible properties, which makes us, uh, you know, really, makes it really nice for probabilists. One of them is, a, is, a, is essentially a, uh, well, it, it's a, both of them are somewhat deterministic, actually. So one of them is that RSK is a bijection, almost surely. So if I take uh, an IID array and I, I, I map things, then almost surely there is, a, you know, I can, I can map it back I can figure out where it came from. Um, and, and you remember, so it takes these zero one arrays and it maps them to, uh, if, you, if you put a Bernoulli measure on the original one, it actually is maps them to non-crossing Bernoulli walks. So they're just Bernoulli random walks, condition not to intersect. And by the way, this kind of, in, in spirit, it just follows from the fact that it's a bijection because you start from uniform measure on these arrays, you end up with uniform measure on, on paths that don't intersect, which is, which is non-crossing Bernoulli walks, okay? And you can actually prove it this way. So you don't need to, uh, you, uh, understanding that it's a bijection is enough to, to prove this. Uh, and the other property of RSK, which is amazing, is that it's an isometry. Right? That's, that's really, really uh, surprising. And, and, and again, it's, it's kind of a miracle. And so so what, does it, what does it mean? So we had a distance function, right, with two parameters, x and y, where we measured what is the distance from the bottom of this thing, somewhere here x, uh, to the top uh, up there at, at y. And, and now I'm also going to define the distance function in, in, uh, in the RSK matrix, so on this, on this Ws. So this is, called, this is called the RSK matrix. It's a distance that's given in terms of these Ws, the image of RSK. And what is it? Well, it's just kind of line last passage percolation. So in order to compute the distance between a point x, point x here and the point y, which is sort of imagine it's to, it's to the top and to the right, is, is you look at paths, okay, which go from x and you, they first go on the green path and then they go for a while on the, on the orange path and they go after on the, on, the, on the blue path. You add their increment and that's going to be the length of a specific path. And then you just maximize over all possible paths. Okay, that's, that's the RSK metric. Uh, of course, you can define this for any, any, any sequence of functions. It def defines a metric this way. And the RSK isometry, uh, this is a completely deterministic fact, has nothing to do with probability, is that, is that these two things, uh, this, this, this is actually an isometry. So the original distance is the, is the same as the new distance. The nice thing about it is that when we, that, that you can take a limit of this isometry, whereas you can't in, in any uh, obvious way take a limit of the original distance because you, you try to take some limit, which is what we always do is to try to, you know, you have some Bernoulli array. Maybe you think, well, there's gonna be some white noise that comes out of it and you can define the distance in terms of that white noise. The answer to that is no, we understand that. The distance has nothing to do with the limiting white noise. There's some other information that, that gives you the distance. However, that information is captured well by the, by, by the RSK image. So, so, so somehow there is a distance now here given in terms of non-intersecting random walks. And well, what is it gonna be? Maybe, maybe, maybe you won't be, uh, won't be uh, surprised. Well, it's going to be the non-intersecting random walks will converge uh, when we take a limit to, 
to non-intersecting Brownian motions, and not just one of them, but infinitely many of them, because we take a limit in, the, in, in both directions. So, so our, our array will actually grow in, in both dimensions, right? So we'll get infinitely many Brownian motions that uh, are conditioned not to intersect. And there is a top one. Uh, and, 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 and these objects, uh, uh, this, this object is called the Airy Line Ensemble. Um, as you can see, it has this kind of curved uh, curvature. In fact, if you add the parabola to, this, to, this, to these lines, then they're going to be stationary in time. Um, so, uh, and as you as as you expect, the RSK metric, which is which is uh, which is what I defined up there, uh, becomes uh, this airy line ensemble metric. So, some metric which is defined in terms of these lines. Um, so, remember we had to go from the bottom to the top. Now there is no bottom anymore because there are infinitely many lines. So, so instead of going going from the bottom at the, at a point, we're going to go from a, an asymptotic direction. So. So you look at the, the airy line ensemble distance from an asymptotic di direction that, that's defined by x to a point y. And y is actually just a point in, in, on the top somewhere. OK, so, so here, is, here is what the asymptotic direction is. It's, 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 it's a long sum parabola. And the shape of the parabola is determined by x. So that's, that's what the airy line ensemble metric is. And this is how you can define lxy. Right? That's, 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 the, that's the point. So, Berlin, there's a question in the chat. Um, it says, do you actually know that the limiting metric in the Bernoulli table is independent of the limiting white noise, or just expect so? Uh, yeah, I, th I think, uh, yeah, we, we know that. Yeah, that's, that's uh, I don't think that's a, that's a problem to prove. Yeah, I, I don't think it's actually written anywhere, but it's, I, I, it's not, it doesn't, I don't think that's difficult. Um, okay, so, so, so some remarks. Okay, so this is how you define this this object. Let me just give you a few remarks about how this uh, where this airy line ensemble thing is. So, so, so when you do non-intersecting random walks, you're all familiar with uh, the Carly McGregor theorem that there can be they can be understood through determinants, um, and these determinants uh, you can often write as as orthogonal polynomials, and then when you take limits of orthogonal polynomials, they become airy functions, especially at their at their edge. At their, at, their, at their last zero. So that's why that's where the airy process comes from. So, so this entire airy line, line on function ensemble can have correlation functions because you can write in terms of these airy functions explicitly. And you know, that would make it a little bit hard to work with this, this airy line ensemble, but there is a beautiful idea, which is the due to Corvin and Hammond, that if you look at uh, this airy line ensemble, then it has this kind of Gibbs property, which the non intersecting random walks uh, have. And, and that makes it makes it uh, actually quite workable. So so you can prove a lot of things about this, this these objects using that. Okay, so so that's uh, that's the short uh, short sketch of how you uh, define uh, these objects. Uh, but let let me talk about it. How you talk a little bit about the limit. So so again, you have this random metric on the plane, right? Um, if you look at two points, the geodesics between them say the point zero, 00 and the point, uh, point zero 0.01, so, so one time later. Geodesics between that point, they're, they're, they're only going to go forward in the time direction. So that means they're going to be functions of time, right? So space is function of time. So geodesic here will actually have a limit. And uh, that, that, is, that is a geodesic in, the, in this directed landscape. Now, the directed landscape also, so geodesics are very easy to define in the limits as well. Just you do it just like in ordinary metric spaces. You define the length of a path by subdividing into into uh, small pieces, and then you, in this case, define an infimum. And geodesics are just simply longest path. You remember we have a minus sign, so we look at longest path as opposed to shortest path. So geodesics are simply longest paths. Its definition is very very easy, and you can show that there is a unique geodesic uh, between uh, any fixed two points almost surely. <laughs> okay, and so 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 there is okay. One thing is that uh, the so you may ask what this geodesic look like, right? It's a kind of an important random function. It comes up in these in these uh, random geometry, and one of the things I'll, I'll talk about is that uh, they actually smoother than uh, Brownian motion. So they're uh, so they're further continuous with exponents two thirds minus, 
and their house of dimension uh, of their graph is four thirds as opposed to three halves. So, you know, if you want to a riddle, tell me, decide which one among those these two paths is, is the Brownian bridge and which one is, is, the, is the geodesic. Um, I'll have them up in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, for the next slide as well. Okay, so these geodesics are our limits of lots of things, okay? And, and one, of, one of the things that they're a limit of is actually the longest increasing subsequence. So, so what is the longest increasing subsequence? So I remember longest increasing subsequence is a sequence. I discussed that this length is approximately two root n and the fluctuations of the length are understood by the by, by, by Johansson theorem. But we are, but let's, we can also be interested in, in, in the sequence itself as opposed to just the length, right? So the sequence is a random, is a list. So it's, you can think of it as a random function and we can understand the asymptotics of this random function. So, so what is it? Well, on the first term, of course, it's linear. And then there are fluctuations, fluctuations of, are of order n to the five, six. And, the, uh, and then there is a limiting function, right? There's a limiting shape gamma, which is a random function. And it's exactly the directed ge geodesic in the directed landscape. So it's, it's the geodesic in this random geometry. Um, we also proved that uh, Duncan Dovern and, 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 and Surab that that these geodesics actually have three halves variation. So just like Brownian motion has quadratic variation, uh, in, in this case, you have three halves variation and the three half variation actually gives the time of the geodesic, like how long, how long it, it, it runs. And there's quite a lot uh, more that you can understand about it. And Duncan will talk about uh, geodesics in the landscape, I think uh, in, in, great, in, in great more detail. Uh, I'd like to turn a little bit to hidden geometries. Um, so, already the longest increasing sequence, subsequence was somewhat a hidden geometry, but of course there's polymers. Uh, there is the KPZ equation, which I'll tell you in a second. And there is TASEP, which comes from biology and random matrices. Um, so let me tell you about the, the KPZ equation. Um, this is of course the equation that gave the name to the, to the entire area, right? So, so remember that uh, polymers are exponential averages of uh, averages of, um, uh, of of length, and this and this distance that you get this way from polymers is uh, is is called the, the free energy, uh, and it satisfies a random difference equation in in in, in Q. Right. So if you know uh, Q to to some some kind of um, to, to to some to some distance, then you can sort of evolve or how, how evolve Q according to some random difference equation. Now you can take a limit of this random difference equation and it becomes uh, a, P, a stochastic PDA, which is called the carter paris jean equation. And it's relation to, uh, so it's an equation that describes continuum polymers. So these are polymers that are Brownian motion based and they're weighted by white noise. Um, so that's, that's the KPZ equation. Um, the best way to, to understand just this one is to exponentiate it and it becomes a stochastic heat equation. Uh, which is clear, which is a clear relation to to polymers, but 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 if you want to kind of define it honestly, even in the cases where this is not where this exponentiation doesn't work, that's very hard. And Martin Heyer got the Fields Medal for for doing that. Um, but and for a long time, it was it was not known, um, you know, how, how exactly this is connected to to this world, and uh, and and you know, just recently uh, the. Me and 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 also Castell and and, and Surav, Jeremy Castell and Surav Sarkar have have shown that uh, this uh, KPZ equation is actually converging to this directed landscape, um, and uh, and and so, so 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 in what sense? Well, you can think of it as a the solution of this equation is, is a random function of space and time, and that random function of space and time converges um, in in some nice topology. Um, this. Uh, so, so, so the, the new thing about this is that this was kind of known for quite a while, uh, starting with with uh, results of uh, Amir Castell and Corbin and, and, and other people uh, that show that um, that actually the, the limit is is um, <coughs> tracy widom distribution. So, so at just one space time point, but but it's actually true even as a function of space and time. And and and, in, and and also in addition, you can do with any initial condition basically, so so not just uh, not just a point. 
Um, so, so basically there is now a new result which says, okay, the, the KPZ equation that uh, gives the name to this whole area actually really strongly belongs to this, to th this class of problems. Uh, so they, it's, it's very strongly related to, to random plane geometry. Um, the other um, interesting uh, model is, <coughs> is TASAP. Um, so, so what happens in TASAP? Well, you have particles that like to jump to the right. They live on the line. You can see here it is on the bottom. And if and they jump if there is nobody in front of them uh, at rate one. Now you can draw this function, which is which which goes up when there is a hole and, and it goes down when there is a particle. It's the height function. And the evolution of um, is just the integral of the TSAP, if you like. Um, the evolution of this uh, function. Uh, is equivalent to the evolution of, of TSAP. And you can, you can ask what is the, is there some limit of this evolution? Um, uh, you have to, so is the way this function evolves is, 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 is you add uh, a corner wherever you can with, with uh, rate one, you can see in these red lines. In fact, you have to take the negative of this function. So, so really you remove a function, you remove a corner at rate one. Um, and uh, Matesky, Kressel, and Remenik showed that there is a scaling limit of this, this evolution, and that scaling limit is, is called the KPZ fixed point. They have uh, determined this K KPZ fixed point using some beautiful uh, determinantal formulas uh, that, that use Brownian hitting probabilities. Um, and, 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 we, and we showed that, in fact, this, uh, this uh, is actually related to the, can be expressed uh, using the um, using the uh, directed landscape in the following way, right? So if you look at, uh, if you start uh, keep, start TASEP with H0, so some initial uh, height function, then the evolution at time t or, or, the, or, the, or the height at time t at location y is, is uh, can be determined as, a, as this optimization problem. So you, so you take the supreme over x, the distance from x at time zero to the point yt in the plane. Um, so you could think of it as the distance from the original from this function h zero uh, as a function of, of, of your point. Um, this thing may look familiar to you. So if you have <clears throat> if you have a Hamilton Jacobi equation, then and you replace this Lx yt with this stretch Euclidean metric, then this solution will amount to what's called the lax aligning solution. Uh, you've probably seen it in, in Berger's equations as well. Uh, these things are, are equivalent. Um, and so you could think of this as some kind of random version of the Berger's equation, um, if, if you like. Um, so so it's, it's, it's kind of a variational solution, just like the lax aligning solution, but it uses this random metric as opposed to a determinist, deterministic metric, which is the stretch Euclidean metric for, for the lax aligning world. So, so you know, using this uh, uh, this representation, we also can show that if you if you take TSAP um, and you start with two different initial conditions, th these things are actually coupled together. Then, then this kind of convergence uh, happens jointly. So, so the same randomness can solve solve many instances of, of, of TSAP, and, and you can take a limit of, of that thing as well. And and, and the and the answer you know, the limit to the, the answer of to the limit is of course just the same. Uh, optimization problem, but you use uh, use the same noise for the two different initial conditions. And finally, there is a there is a result that uh, is is you know resolves a, a question that has been around for a while, and there's been some beautiful work by by um, Alan Hammond and, and others, which is that when you look at this the this uh, kind of random Burgers equation or KPZ fixed point. Uh, then the solution um, at any positive time looks like a Brownian motion locally. So, so the statement is in any compact interval, uh, you're absolutely continuous with respect to Brownian motion. And uh, that's kind of neat because H0, right? The initial condition can be something terribly ugly. Uh, it has nothing to do with Brownian motion, but at, at basically zero time, you suddenly become Brownian-like. And also the, the variance of this Brownian motion is always the same for every time. It's always, always two. In, in this specific uh, setting, so so it's uh, it, it's really interesting how uh, this this PD or this uh, the stochastic PD kind of smooths out uh, 
your your uh, your problem in 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 in, in no time. Uh, uh, so that's right. So um, finally, uh, I uh, want, there is just uh, one uh, one application. So if you know, uh, you probably have seen uh, mRNA in the news recently because it's in like two of the two of the vaccines are based on mRNA techniques and about about uh, <clears throat> about COVID. Um, so. Uh, so the ribosome is this this uh, gadget that goes along the mRNA and and uh, and translates it into a into, into a protein, and and uh, when when these ribosomes go go along the mRNA, they there's more than one and they create traffic jams, and uh, biologists actually study uh, these traffic jams using TASAP. So TASAP is a model that was actually invented for biological things like this, not exactly for this, but it, it but its first appearance. Is is actually uh, in biology, and and uh, it's it's before before uh, probabilists and physicists. So so it's it's actually in some sense a quite an applied an applied model. Um, so that's uh, that's it. Okay, I, I rushed very fast. So I'm actually done. Um, uh, so I, I open up for questions. Maybe maybe. Uh, I can talk more about certain details in, in, while answering specific questions. Hey, thank you very much. Um, before we move to the questions, I'll just ask um, everyone to unmute so that we can um, that we can thank Balant for for the talk. any questions they'd like to ask. So either um, you can raise your hand um, or you can write it in the chat uh, or if no one's speaking, you can just um, unmute yourself and, and ask your question. So, so I have probably, a, maybe it's a really obvious question, um, but you mentioned the connection between the the Eden model um, having be, being being a, um, a metric ball. Um, it, yes. Is is that exactly the same topology that, that you get that it's a metric ball in, or are, are they are they are they different? So, so there are two statements, <laughs> and the first is that uh, the first is that the Eden model. Yeah, so you can define the graph distance. Uh, using exponential random variables on on the grid, and and the Eden model is exactly a ball in that in the distance. And the way the Eden model grows is you just you just uh, letting the radius uh, grow. So it's it's actually a precise uh, probabilistic identity that is, is nice to to check. Uh, the the other statement is, is is of course conjectural, which is that that you know the the distance in which the Eden model is a ball is converging to this. To this uh, directed metric, a directed landscape. That's uh, that's just a conjecture. But but it, but in in particular, what it would imply is that the fluctuations of the Eden model near the boundary are they look like a brand new motion. They look like this airy process. Uh, and but 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 the scaling is of course funny. So the scaling would be one third, so just like all of these models. Um, so it's so so the Eden model itself is just a random geometry uh, model that that uh, you expect to have uh, the same scaling limit in, because it's in this universality class. Okay, thanks. Um, oh, um, Alessandra has a hand up. Um, yes, uh, yes, I have a question. So uh, when discussing the longest increasing subsequence concerning permutations. You mentioned uh, uh, the introduction of a parameter y, but what, what is y? Could you say something yes. more? So, so you see, um, you see here you have you have um, you have this uh, longest decreasing subsequence in this grid, right? And um, it represented as a in this grid, and 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 you know basically instead of just understanding the distance to a fixed fixed corner of this grid, you could you could have a parameter here, which is which is which is what the what the other endpoint of this geodesic is, right? And that could be your y. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, thanks. I have a question in the chat from um, Patrick saying, do you see any way to getting Tracy Willem distribution without passing by exactly solvable models? That's a very good question. Uh, you know, the question is, you know, what's the definition of C? Uh, yes. Uh, and, um, you know, there is actually a first universality result, uh, which, which I, should, I should have mentioned actually, is, 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 due, is part of Surav and Jeremy's work. Uh, so Jeremy Castan and Surav Sarkar's work on, on the universality of KPZ. So they also showed that, they also showed that uh, ASAP, uh, which is asymmetric simple occlusion, which is some version of, of TASAP, uh, with fairly general, uh, non-integrable uh, step distributions, also, also converges. So I think that's the, the proof goes through a comparison with a, with a exactly solvable model. So I don't know to what, what degree you would take that as, as, as non-integrable. Uh, but, but I think, but at least the model, you know, these models that they can show convergence, they, they don't need integrability at all. So, so in that sense, you... In you know, this sense, yes, this is, so they show universality without identifying the limit. But the limit is known because we know what is the limit of this, right? Yes, that's true. Yes, yeah, so exactly. like so you're, you're, you're correct about that. Yeah. Okay. Now this is not integrable from my point of view. The model that I consider. So, you know, if you if you want, so you could try. I, I thought about it. There is a way to define the limit, although it's still a conjecture, right? So, <laughs> so let me see. I I'm going to show you the airy line ensemble. So this Ari line ensemble, remember, has this property that if I add to it a parabola, and then it's then it's shift invariant. And the other property is the Gibbs property. If I erase some finite part of it, then uh, condition on, on, on outside of that finite part, what you just see is non-intersecting Brownian motions, conditioned to you know end up at the right place and avoid the right things. Uh, so the conjecture is that this property um, set actually uniquely determined uh, this the Ari line ensemble. Okay, up to some trivial shifts. Uh, and, and so you could define that, you could use that as a definition that is completely conceptual, right? Uh, it's conjectural, unfortunately. And then you would have a definition of the entire limit without any formulas or, or anything uh, integrable. It's a, still a different story of whether you could prove convergence uh, that way. Uh, but, but actually, there are actually there are also directions. Uh, there are also also some because you see airy line ensembles are these non-intersecting walks are uh, are related to random matrices <coughs> and in matrix theory. There are lots of proofs now that that don't use any integrability. Um, on the other hand, the connection between this RSK connection is is, is very integrable, and I, I don't know how to to remove that in any of the proofs. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question in the chat um, saying, uh, is there anything interesting to be said about the boundary of this metric and in brackets, Boozman? Um, yes, lots of, lots of interesting things. So, um, yeah, um, in fact, you know, one of the classical ways of understanding, say, limit shapes is by is by is, is by understanding the Boosman function. So you can sort of define the distance from infinity in this in in as a function of a direction, right? And and a distance from infinity actually turns out to be a brand has 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 a law of a Brownian motion, just an ordinary Brownian motion. And then you can look at this Brownian motion evolving, uh, and then you get some kind of stationary stationary versions of your of your distance. Um, so there is there are lots of uh, there are lots of uh, uh, work on, 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 on these kind of questions. Uh, in particular, um, in particular, there is a question whether there are infinite geodesics, right? So, so I think the state of the art says that that uh, if you if you fix a direction, then there is always only um, a unique. There are no two infinite geodesics. And so it's always if you take two of them, they always uh, uh, coalesce. But but there's some some exceptional directions where where there are two, and this is kind of kind of related to your your Boosman function question. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. Um, are there, oh, here we go, um, one more question. Um, do you know what happens in, say, 3D last passage percolation where the relation to random matrices isn't obvious or doesn't make sense? Um, so, uh, yes, so, so this is, this is a, a little bit related to Patrick's question because, so, so we believe there is a model in 3D, there is a, a limit in 3D. Uh, it seems like the, the scaling exponents, even the exponents are uh, not expected to be nice. So as a, these one, two, three here are just going to be some strange numbers. And, um, you know, in, in 2D, we're, at the, we're just at the boundary of where, where we'll perhaps we'll be able to understand this thing without integrability. And we don't really expect any integrability in 3D, although that can always happen. Somebody comes up with some, some amazing integrable system that, that could always happen. Uh, although the, these funny exponents sort of suggest that that won't happen, to be honest. Um, and uh, so, so, so I think the, 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 the accessible work is, is and you know, it's, it's something that a lot of us are, are working on, is to, is to do the two-dimensional case, but, but without any integrability. Right? So just conceptually or somehow by understanding the internal structure. Uh, and then perhaps if, if that's done, then we can also go on to 3D, which is much harder. Uh, but, but you see, we really hard, we, we, everything in here relies on two dimensional, two dimensions in, in, in a very deep way. And everything is different in two dimensions. You know, like, like uh, uh, geodesics who always have to, have to cross if they're in the right uh, configuration and 3D, they, they don't have to at all. So then that's, that's a serious difference in, in, in two and 3D. Okay, thank you. Are there any any further questions? Um, either raise your hand or or write something in the chat. Yes, maybe. Uh, yeah, right. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, hey, Valim. Uh, a naive question: Is there a way to directly find this directed landscape from from a random matrix theory? Let's say from the edge of large random matrices. Yes. So, so you know this airy line ensemble, right? Mm -hmm. Is is the limit of Dyson's Brownian motion. So Dyson's oh, Brownian motion is you just take matrix by the Brownian motion and look at the eigenvalues. Okay? Okay. Uh, so if these, are, these are Hermitian matrices so in the complex setting, then the edge limit of Dyson's Brownian motion is exactly that. So, so you, can, you can already say, well, it's already defined in terms of random matrices. But, <laughs> but uh, there is one thing it's, which, which, is, which is mysterious. So, so one thing that we, so we can relate uh, random matrices to this one parameter process, L of zero Y, but we cannot relate them to L of X, Y as a two parameter process. So, um, you know, Sasha Sodin has some nice work we had where he introduced two parameter versions of these random matrix processes, but these are not those, they're completely different. So one of the interesting thing about L of X, Y is that when you look at you know, it's, it's multiple values at different uh, X's and Y's. Uh, they're not necessarily supported on, entire, on the entire uh, possible support. So there's some places where, it, where they, they don't charge. And I, I can show you what, what's happening. So basically, if you take two times, let me see if I can draw here. If you take two times uh, and you look at, you know, two, two geodesics like this, and actually you're gonna have four geodesics. Okay, so if you, so this is a, I don't know, a trapezoid in, if it was Euclidean, right? And you know that uh, there's some theorem in geometry that the sum of the diagonals of the trapezoids is longer than the sum of the uh, opposite, opposite sides, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, that's just two triangle inequalities put together. But that theorem also holds in, in random geometry. So that tells you that this, these, uh, this, this very, um, this LXY this is, is actually there's some places where it doesn't put any support because there is a strong inequality and, 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 and actually I don't know of any random matrix area distributions that have this property where there's some, some strict non-support <clears throat> Thank you Okay, um, if there are no further questions
questions. Um, maybe we should all uh, thank thank Balint once more. Okay, and we'll um, we'll meet back in. Um, should we say? Two minutes past three, so we'll have a five minute break for people can just get some coffee um, and then we'll start again uh, just after um, just after the hour uh, for the, the second talk. Thank you. So, uh, Duncan, if you want to share your screen, maybe. Yes, left. Yeah, I'll, um, one second. Okay. It's up to you if you want to, to have some relax, some break. I, oh, hold on, I, I shared the wrong thing. I think, did I? Okay. This looks reasonable now, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. anyway. Uh, Okay, we resume in uh, four minutes. Okay, if you Sounds want uh, to relax, <laughs> it's up to you. Okay, I think it's time to start again. So maybe Duncan, you can uh, um, uh, appear. I've, okay. I've, I've hopefully appeared now. Okay, so. okay, okay. I don't see you, but uh, you you should be somewhere. I don't see you. Uh, but but I see your slides. Can can you can you hear me? Yes, yes. Duncan. Yes, yes. Okay. So we can hear you. Uh, just if you want uh, to show your. Uh, 
Okay, face. Okay, it's more uh, human, I would say. So it's nice to see also the face. Yeah, I can, I, I, can, I, I can see Duncan. Yeah, yeah. I, my my video has been on though for a while, so it should be okay. 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 Yeah, we see both. Uh, okay, the slides and also your face. So, okay. uh, so it's time to start again. Just uh, an, an announcement. So next week we will have uh, two talks uh, of uh, Rick Canyon. Uh, so now it's uh, so it's a pleasure to host uh, Duncan Dobell from, from Princeton University. We we'll give a talk on building the directed uh, landscape. So please. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, so this is kind of a, a follow-up to Balance talk. So he introduced this object, the directed landscape, and he was talking about all of the different, um, you know, different models uh, in random geometry and related areas, uh, which are expected to converge to the directed landscape. Um, and I, in this talk, I'm going to do two things. So the kind of first half or two thirds of the talk is going to be going into a little bit more detail about exactly how this object is built. Um, and I'm going to focus on one uh, particular really nice integrable model, which uh, we first built this object with in the paper of uh, myself and Janos and uh, Balan. So Janos, Balan, and I built this thing. And then in the second part, um, I'm going to talk about some newer work with uh, Ling Fu Zhang, where we explore uh, you know, one particular property of this object, which gives you some really nice tools for working with a directed landscape. Okay, so let me start with the model, which is uh, Brownian last passage percolation. So it's a bit like this, um, it's gonna be a bit like this uh, Bernoulli IID model that Baumann was talking about, but instead of having an array with Bernoulli random variables, you're going to have uh, a sequence of independent Brownian motions. So that's your B. And then on top of the sequence of independent Brownian motions, which is sort of going to supply your uh, independent noise, uh, if you look at a path which is non-increasing, you can define the length of this path. So the, I think this is easiest to express through a picture. So say I have my Brownian motions B1 down to Bn. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm always going to have my indices going up on the page. So if I have a path, uh, so a cad lag non-increasing path from x to y, I can sort of superimpose its graph on top of these Brownian motions. And the length, this pi b, is just the sum of all of these increments. So it's a reasonable definition of uh, path length in sort of a random environment. Okay. And so now that we have a definition of path length, uh, we can go ahead and define a metric like structure. So usually if you were going to define a metric, you would say take uh, the length of the shortest path between two points as your distance. Um, because we're working with last passage percolation, uh, we're going to flip things and we're going to take the length of the longest possible path between two points in order to define the metric. So maybe just to draw one more picture, in the simple case of two lines, if I want to find my distance from here to here, my best possible path is going to kind of pick up this increment and then jump at the smallest gap between these two lines and spend the rest of the time on the top line. Um, and this is a directed metric um, in the sense that Ballant was talking about. Uh, and one manifestation of that is that we only assign these sort of distance, these sort of distances to points in a particular order. So we specify that the points are oriented um, in this way in space where X is less than or equal to Y and M is greater than or equal to N. So this point down here being X M and this point up here being X. Uh, YM. So as I said, we're going to think of Brownian last passage percolation as a directed metric on R cross Z, and we'll call paths that achieve this supremum geodesic. So it turns out, you know, by compactness, the geodesics are always going to exist between any two points. 
Okay. So then uh, what we did is when we constructed the directed landscape, this was the pre-limiting model that we're using. Um, so this is a, you know, sort of the theorem, which I'll unpack, um, is that if you look at the rescaled Brownian last passage value across a span of uh, order n lines, so the way we set it up, we're going from roughly line negative s n here to negative t n here. So we're looking at a span of n lines here. We're going. Yes. I heard some voice, but I don't understand. Is there some question? No, maybe it was just a distro. Don't worry. Go okay, on. I won't worry about it. Okay, so we sort of go go a distance of n lines uh, in the vertical direction, and we're going to go a distance of n in the horizontal as well. So this is. We're kind of going from x, s here to y, t up there. And these are the kind of distances we're taking limits of. And you see this here, you can see this uh, 1, 2, 3 kpz scaling. So we look at an uh, order n to the 2 thirds window in the horizontal direction. We look at an order n window in the vertical direction. And we're rescaling our values by n to the one third. So there's your one, two, three scaling. Um, and I don't want to focus uh, too much on exactly the type of convergence in this theorem. I'm, I'm going to state a couple of theorems like this. Uh, but basically, what this is saying is that your Brownian last passage value uh, up to some mean term is equal to the directed landscape plus an error term. And this error term is small in the sense that it's converging in distribution to zero uh, in the uniform on compact topology on the appropriate parameter space. OK, so I want to say this is just going to be a little bit of a refresher on some things that Balat was saying about the landscape. So again, we're going to think of it as a distance between pairs of points in the plane. So we have x, s down here and y, t up here. And it's uh, these are not just, uh, you don't think of this as sort of the usual plane. We're going to have one time-like direction going up and one space-like direction going across. And so we only assign distances moving forward in time. And so this is, it has this domain where we assign distances where s is less than t. And it's a nice, you know, it's a continuous function on its domain. Okay. And then another thing that Balat mentioned is that you can define uh, path lengths and geodesics in this space. So we can define path lengths by subdivision. So what is a path going to be in L? So if I, because I can only move forward in time, I can think of my paths as functions taking in a time coordinate and spitting out a spatial coordinate. So this point here is say the point pi of r comma r, and this would be maybe pi of t comma t. So I'm sort of drawing the uh, graph of my path but, you know, with the usual coordinates for the graph uh, inverted. Um, and the way that you define path length here is by repeated subdivision of the path. So if you wanted to define path length in Euclidean space, again, this is something Ballant mentioned, you could just say, okay, take a curve, um, approximate it by finer and finer piecewise linear curves, um, and take the uh, limit of the lengths of these uh, finer and finer divisions. And so this is how we define path length here. OK, so then when do we see a geodesic? So a geodesic is just a path whose length is the distance between its endpoints. OK, and this definition is reasonable. And one way that we know that it's reasonable is um, 
these line these are exactly the limits of geodesics in Brownian mass passage percolation. Or more generally, if you set up some model to converge to the directed landscape, you know, if you can do this for some model, these geodesics will be the natural limits of the geodesics in your pre-limit. Okay, so how do you go about building this uh, directed landscape out? So it's really characterized by uh, four properties plus continuity. Um, so the first one is an independent increment property that uh, Ballant mentioned. So maybe I don't need to draw this twice. So say I have dis, uh, disjoint time slices. So I'm going from S1 to T1 and S2 to T2. So if I go back to the pre-limit, then this is like Brownian last passage across Two, dis, two disjoint sets of Brownian motions. And because these sets were independent, um, that means the Brownian last passage values from here to here and from here to here are independent. And of course, this independence gets inherited by the landscape itself. Okay. Um, the second property is uh, what we call a metric composition law. So this uh, does the following thing. It's going to allow you to take your increment from time s to time r and your increment from time r to time t and construct the increment from time s all the way up to time t. So how does this work? So say I wanted to go from xs all the way up to yt. Well, if you think back to Brownian last passage, but this is going to be the same as uh, in the landscape, my distance is going to be achieved on some geodesic going through a point at time r. And so what you can do is you can just fish back and forth for the best possible sum of the length from here to here plus the length from here to here. And this gives you the uh, distance from xs all the way up to yt. So this is what we call the metric composition law, okay? And if you combine, so independent increments plus metric composition uh, gives you in some sense a structure, it gives you a strong structure for the joint distribution of all increments in the directed landscape. Because if you filter down to the level where your increments are disjoint, um, then they're gonna be independent and you can build up all increments beyond that using this metric composition, okay? So really the key is just establishing what's going on from one time slice to the next time slice. So from time A to time B. And we can reduce this even further by using a scale and translation variance of this object. So L satisfies this one, two, three scaling invariance. Sort of, uh, this is built in because it's a scaling limit. It also satisfies a translation invariant. So if we shift the time slices, if we shift the times up by the same amount, then nothing changes. So this just corresponds to shifting your or recentering your uh, collection of Brownian motions. And so this tells you that if you want to go from time A to time B, this is just a rescaling of going from time zero to time one. And so then we arrive at sort of the fourth and most important property for building L is that we need to understand the airy sheet, which is the landscape value going from time zero to time one. So this function S of X, Y that, that Ballant was talking about. Okay. So as he said, there's, what we do is we're gonna build this up um, using, uh, we're going to go back to approaching last passage percolation via the RSK bijection. Okay, so in order to do this, I'm going to extend the definition of last passage percolation to multiple paths. So it's going to be a little bit more general than what uh, Balan was talking about, and this is going to also come up later. Uh, Duncan, sorry if I stop you, if I yeah. interrupt you. So there is, okay, uh, there was a question, but already answered just uh, in this moment. In the chat, there was a question in the chat. Please go. Okay, okay. Okay, so I wanted to find uh, last passage percolation with multiple paths or with multiple start and end points. So say I have 
start points x1, x2, x3. And for now, I'm just going to move from line n to line 1. And maybe I end at y1 and maybe y2 equals y3. Then I can define the last passage value between this uh, x1, x at the start and y at the end as just the maximum, well, do the wrong thing here, as just the maximum possible sum of three lengths I can get by optimizing over disjoint paths between these points. Okay, so because I'm enforcing this disjointness condition, this is different than just summing up the three last passive values. And because of the way your metric structure works with the um, paths are always gonna wanna collect the same good bits of noise. Um, and so there's sort of a genuine interesting difference between studying this multi-point uh, last passage percolation and single point last passage percolation. Okay. And so we use this multi-point last passage percolation to define uh, essentially the RSK correspondence or sometimes we call this the melon map um, because this W output is gonna look like a melon. So usually when, um, for those who are familiar with RSK, often it's presented as a correspondence between an array of numbers and um, two semi-standard Young tableaux. So sort of an array of uh, non-negative integers and two semi-standard Young tableaux. Um, and here, this is kind of a functional version where we, uh, where our output corresponds to one of these Young tableaux. So what's the picture? So we take n Brownian motions to start. We spit out n functions, w1 through wm. And the rule is that if we sum up wi of y from 1 to k, then this is just the multipoint last passage value from a cluster of points at 0 to a cluster of points at y. So in particular, this tells you that w1 of y is just the last passage value from zero to y. Again, remembering I'm always going from line n to line one here. So you sort of do progressively better as y increases. So this w1 is a, you know, it's not a monotone function, but it has a trajectory upwards. And then w2 is the, uh, w2 is gonna be the, um, what you gain by adding a second disjoint path. So you don't do quite as well as uh, when you just had one path. So you gain a little bit less for W2. And then W3 is your gain by adding a third disjoint path and so on. And so it turns out these WIs are ordered. And so they kind of look like stripes on a watermelon. And that's why sometimes we call this the melon map. And there's a theorem which, uh, in the case of, I'm, you know, I'm going to state the theorems here for just this model of Brownian last passage, that goes back to O'Connell and Yor which says that W is given by N non-intersecting Brownian motions, or it's a Dyson's Brownian motion. Um, and so they're really nice formulas for understanding this W. You can take limits. Um, and in particular, that allows you to take the limit of this process, uh, this last passage process from uh, starting at location zero and ending at some location one. And again, as Balant mentioned, this converges to an object. If you sort of take the richest possible scaling limit of this melon, you get an object called the airy line ensemble. So this is a theorem which, um, in a slightly different model, goes back to Preoffer and Schoen. And then the, the version I'm stating is, is due to Corwin and Hannah. And let me just, again, it's more enlightening to draw a picture than to try and just parse the uh, just parse the formula. So I'm gonna take a scaling window centered in the top section of lines. So sort of an order one amount of lines up here and an order n to the two thirds window around time n. And I get this parabolic airy line ensemble. So I call this, I'm mean, gonna use this uh, script B for the parabolic area line ensemble. And the term parabolic here is coming from the fact that there's this parabolic pull downward, so this roughly has a parabolic shape. Um, 
And the way you can think of this is there's a non-intersection property with these paths, which is pushing them up. And there's a parabolic property, which is pulling them down at the edges. And so these two effects kind of cancel each other out uh, to give an object which is sort of stable under uh, a natural resampling. Can I ask a question about that? Yep. Um, that, that scaling. So uh, at the end of the two thirds scaling, comparing to the, when, when, you, when you construct the directed landscape at the beginning, there was like end of the negative one third scaling in, in one of the variables. Um, um, that may have been a typo on, let me try and go all the way back. Um, the, the end of the two thirds is matching up with this end of the two thirds here. Right. And then there's, there's an end to the one third scaling of space. There shouldn't be any end to the minus one thirds. But sometimes oh, if you I've do this in it. Maybe I was reading your I was reading your paper recently. Maybe I saw in the, the, minus the paper has different scaling. I've I've I matched see. up the scaling so that it looks like I one okay. end of the two thirds, end of the one third. Maybe just as a general comment for people, you can do this scaling in various ways, right? Because you can just rescale the Brownian motions. Um, so instead of going from time zero to time n, you could go from time zero to time one. And by Brownian scaling, sort of things shift in an in a you know you know expected way. Thank you. So then this other fact about um, this uh, RSK melon map is it's an isometry, okay? And I'm stating this in terms of, it's a full multi-point isometry. So if you take arbitrary last passage values across your Brownian motions with multiple start and end points, then this is preserved when you pass to this melon. And in fact, this is one way you can characterize uh, what this map is. So it's, it's the unique map which takes uh, a collection of arbitrary functions, spits out a collection of ordered functions, and preserves all multipoint last passage values from uh, across the two sets of functions. So this is also, you know, in addition to being a very interesting property, it's also a characterization of this map. Okay, so now the question is, we have this theorem, um, you know, we have this melon, which is nice, um, but does this isometry that we had before, does this actually help us understand um, our goal, which is to understand last passage percolation when we're varying both one parameter down here and one parameter up here. So this isometry certainly tells us that it's gonna be interesting to look at the melon, but you know, no matter how nice we think melons are, it shouldn't necessarily be the case that uh, non-intersecting Brownian motions are simpler than just independent Brownian motions. And what saves us turns out to be that the geodesic branching structure gets to be a lot simpler in the melon than it was across your original Brownian motions B. So this is, this is the picture of, of what happens with geodesic branching. So say I'm going from starting at the point zero and I look at my geodesics up to N and up to say N plus N to the two thirds and maybe some points in between. So if I go across my original Brownian motions, what you see is a geodesic tree that looks something like this. Maybe I won't draw everything. And so you see branch points like this and all of the branch points lie in the bulk. So they're, you know, sitting somewhere in the middle of this set of end lines that we're going across. So now let's go over and see what's happening in the melon. Okay, so I'm starting at zero. So I'm starting at this cluster of points in the corner where, where all of the melon functions are the same. And because of the ordering of these functions, my last passage geodesics just want just go to the top line and stay there. This is just a consequence of the fact that these are ordered. So if I'm going up to n or n plus n to the two thirds, any one of these things, then all my last passage geodesics just follow 
what's happening on the top line. Okay, so somehow we have this really uh, complicated branching structure in the original Brownian motions. It becomes completely trivial in the melon. And you can also think of this as a manifestation of the fact that, you know, this top line is just, uh, of course, the last passage value from zero to y. So this is somehow unsurprising. So now what happens if you, instead of starting at zero, if I start at, say, x times n to the 2 thirds away here. So at the level of the Brownian motions, I see roughly the same thing. So I'm going to see maybe something like this. Maybe I see some branch points like this one, which might be the same for red and blue. I see some that are different, but all the branch points are going to occur in bulk. But now, in, if you go over to the melon, the branching structure is still simpler than it is in the original Brownian motion. So it's not going to be simpler in the sense that all the branching occurs trivially on the top line but all the branching is somehow forced into the top corner. So maybe. And one way you can think that maybe it seems reasonable that it's gonna be forced into the top corner, which I'll make precise in a second, is that if this, if a red branch point lines up with a blue branch point, then the corresponding branch points, it seems reasonable that they're also going to uh, align in the melon. And so that corresponds to sort of branching happening on the top line. But even if these branch points are different, so say you have a branch point over here and you have a branch point over here, the branch point still occurs in the top corner in the sense that it's in the top order one amount of lines here and in an order n to the two thirds scaling window over here. So all the branching is getting compressed. And what's nice about this is now this branching structure survives when we take a limit to go to the airy line ensemble. OK. So then what can you do with this? So if I look at the difference between two Brownian last passage values. This is the same as the difference between two last passage values in W. And if we sort of believe this uh, thing that I put on the other page, then this is the same thing as the difference between two last passage values from a branch point, which survives into this airy line ensemble limit. So you can expect that all differences of this form are contained in the airy line ensemble. And this is kind of the key idea um, for constructing the airy sheet. So this is the, the theorem which is going to characterize the airy sheet, which is this L of x0, y1. So there are two things involved in the characterization. The first just says that if we look at um, the airy sheet and we shift the entire process by some amount t, then we see the same object in distribution. Okay, this is just a consequence of uh, time stationarity of, um, this is just a consequence of time stationarity of the original Brownian motions. The next thing is uh, saying that differences in the airy sheet are just differences of last passage values in the airy line ensemble. And the thing here is, well, how do we know what point we look at if we want to take a difference. If How do we know what's the right point to look at for finding the differences between the last passage values? And the right point turns out to be, uh, it's not possible to pinpoint with probability one, but you can sort of pinpoint it with ever increasing probability as you take uh, this limit k to infinity uh, and you follow xk along a particular parabola. So what happens is, Again, the picture looks something like this. So the, if I just kind of think about what's happening in this airy line ensemble top corner, these xk's kind of hug where the true 
here that's where it goes. Okay. And eventually they're going to fall below this branch point. Okay, so that's a, a kind of a heuristic picture for what's going on in the area sheet. Um, and I'm going to mention it here. It's not completely obvious from the definitions, but what this tells you is that uh, the parabolic airy line ensemble contains um, the half airy sheet. So it contains the airy sheet as long as you are starting at a positive value x or a non-negative value x. Um, and in fact, I'll also mention that it's it's not contained in this current theorem that I put up. It's contained, but in an upcoming work with balance, uh, we actually show that it, the one consequence of that is we're going to show that the whole area sheet is actually contained in B. So you don't need to just restrict to X uh, non-negative. But it's kind of a side point for the purposes of this talk. OK, so let's say, what have we done so far? So we've shown that there's a correspondence between the kind of fundamental idea, the key to constructing this directed landscape was constructing a correspondence between L of x0, y1, and the parabolic area line ensemble by roughly showing that you know, in heavy quotation marks that uh, this landscape value is like a last passage value from x at infinity, where this is sort of some uh, asymptotic direction to a point y1. And so you can ask, well, how far does this correspondence extend? And what other information can we extract from the correspondence? Um, uh, and it turns out that a natural place to start is to try and take the limit of the whole multipoint isometry. So, so far we tried to understand the limit of this isometry for single points X and Y, but it's gonna be, uh, it's also possible to take the limit of the whole multipoint isometry. And uh, this is gonna turn out to give you genuinely interesting and novel information about the directed landscape. Um, so if we want to take the limit of this isometry, we need some way of understanding, um, we need a better way of understanding multi-point uh, last passage percolation across the airy line ensemble. So that's gonna be what uh, we define next. So our goal is just to define lengths of infinite paths in the airy line ensemble. And we want these paths to have an asymptotic direction. So I'm gonna call this, this asymptotic direction uh, we call these parabolic paths. So these are, before we had a path going from sort of x times n to the 2 thirds up to n. And in the melon, this had a parabolic direction. So these are the kind of paths we care about defining lengths of in the airy line ensemble. So what's a reasonable definition? Well, let's start by saying, okay, the best possible path should take on this airy sheet value from x to y. So the first thing is you can express this airy sheet in terms of, the, you can express the half airy sheet in terms of your parabolic airy line ensemble. And the best possible path length is s of x, y. And now the question is, well, how close is your path length to this s of x, y? And so a reasonable thing to do is the following. You take your path, and just look at, uh, look at it on some compact interval from z to y, and you see, well, how close was your path in length to the optimal possible path between these values? So this is, you know, this is a non-positive number here. Oh. You're just looking at the difference between its length on this finite interval compared to the optimal possible length. And as you take z to infinity, this gives you a sense of the discrepancy between how close your path is and how close the optimal path is, which should have length s of x, y. So this turns out it's a reasonable definition of path length. Um, it's actually a fairly workable definition. It has lots of nice properties. And then you can use this to define um, sort of in the obvious way, multipoint uh, last passage values across the area line ensemble. So basically, if you have vectors x and y, then you can say that the airy line ensemble last passage value from x to y is just the best possible sum of path lengths along parabolic paths from xi to yi. So this could be with your disjoint. 
So it's just like in the finite case, you're going to be taking the optimal possible sum of path lengths where the paths look like this. Okay. And it turns out that this is the uh, right notion of the limit of, um, this is the right notion of the limit of multipoint uh, Brownian last passage values. Okay, so this is a, so we call this limit the extended area sheet. So this is a theorem uh, with, of myself and Ling Fujang. So if you take the limit of all multipoint last passage values from line n to line one, then up to some mean terms, this is just a function S of X, Y, which we call the extended area sheet. So um, S takes values in this uh, kind of funny parameter space, which is the space of all possible pairs X, Y, but it's the extended area sheet in the sense that if you just restrict to R2, so single values of X and Y, this is the usual area sheet. And how do we do this? Well, of course, we're gonna use this construction of last passage across the airy line ensemble. So it turns out that you can, okay, so the second part of this theorem is that you can couple S with a parabolic airy line ensemble. So that for any points where the starting point X1 is non-negative, S of XY is just the last passage value across the airy line ensemble from X. Y. So this is, you know, this is the limit of this multipoint isometry. And um, it actually, in, stated in this way, it actually looks a lot more like the limit of the isometry than the original theorem did. Okay. okay, so then there's this, just like we built the directed landscape from airy sheets, um, we're using this sort of four point characterization, you can do the exact same thing with extended area sheets, and you can build what I'll call an extended directed landscape. So this is L of vector X, S, vector Y, T. And this turns out to be the full scaling limit of Brownian last passage percolation. Okay. And sort of unsurprisingly, um, you can also express this extended landscape in terms of the actual directed landscape. So the uh, extended landscape, you can also say that L of XSYT is just the best possible sum of K disjoint path lengths between the corresponding points in the original directed landscape. So this is, uh, the maximum is over uh, all collections of disjoint paths pi i with pi i of S equal to S i and pi i of T equal to Y i. Um, so this, maybe I'll say, something about this, this is actually, until you construct the extended landscape in this way using extended airy sheets, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't even, it, it's not even clear how to make sense of the right hand side here. So somehow this is actually the second point, though it seems quite natural, it's actually uh, really quite non-trivial and uh, a lot of work to prove. Okay. So we've constructed this extended landscape. And we, what we were trying to do, if I, we think back to this recap slide, is say, how far does this uh, correspondence between L and B extend? And what information can we extract? So in terms of how far it extends, how far it extends really is it extends to the level of multipoint last passage values. So the correspondence sort of the best version of this correspondence looks like this, that L from X zero to Y one is just a last passage value across uh, the parabolic area line ensemble from a vector X to a vector one. But now the question is, what can we do with this? Why was this an interesting exercise? Um, and it turns out this gives a new way of analyzing geodesic disjointness in L. And I think this is, uh, so I, th I think this is really, you know, the, the most interesting thing about this extended landscape construction. So let me explain uh, what I mean by this. So suppose that you have uh, vectors x1, x2, and y1, y2. I mean, you can do this with more points, but let's just start here. So what does it mean for there to be disjoint L geodesics from 
uh, between these pairs of points. So this is the situation we're trying to understand is when do you go and see this? So x1, y1, x2, y2. And the answer is going to be, well, that's exactly when the multipoint last passage value is the sum of the single point last passage values. OK? But by this correspondence above, that's the same as when the multipoint last passage value in the parabolic area line ensemble is the same as those single point last passage values, which holds if and only if there are disjoint geodesics between those points in the area line ensemble. So the point of this is that we took a, what was a difficult problem, which was understanding disjointness of geodesics in this funny continuous directed landscape. And we've exchanged it for a problem of understanding disjoint geodesics in uh, this much simpler parabolic airy line ensemble. So we've gone from a fully continuous setting to a semi-discrete setting, for example. Um, and you can really get a lot of mileage out of this. So you can use this correspondence to start exploring the structure of disjointness and coalescence of geodesics in L. So maybe I'll just give one example of this. So say I'm Say I'm looking at the directed landscape and I want to understand, and I'm looking at my geodesic tree from zero, and I want to understand the process of points y, where I see two geodesics uh, from zero to y. So this turns out to be, um, this is almost surely a countable set. Um, and what you'll see with all these geodesics is you'll just sort of see a little bubble on the other end here. And you can ask, well, what can we say about this process? And this turns out to correspond to something very precise in the airy line ensemble. So you should expect all of these structures correspond to something in the airy line ensemble. So what does they, these y correspond to? Local minima of the process B1 minus B2, so just the difference of these top two lines. In particular, B1 minus B2 is absolutely continuous with respect to a Brownian motion. So basically, when you look at this process of non-uniqueness times for your geodesic, non-uniqueness locations for your geodesic tree, this is almost like uh, looking at a process of local minimum, lo the, looking at a local minimum process for a Brownian motion. Okay, and let me give you one more um, upshot of this uh, extended landscape construction, which is that you can pass the RSK correspondence to the limit. Um, so what does this, what do I mean by this? So if you look at your directed landscape from times zero to one, then from this object, I can construct my extended landscape value from a cluster of points at zero to a cluster of points at y, which is the same thing as uh, looking at the corresponding last passage in B. And then when I look at last passage in B, and I'm starting at a cluster of points at zero, it turns out that your last passage paths just follow these top lines. Okay. And so what you pick up is just a sum of the top k lines of B at the point Y. So this really does look very similar to the RSK correspondence in the finite case. Um, and so what this really is saying is that one half of the RSK correspondence passes to the limit. So you can reconstruct your airy line ensemble from your directed landscape. Um, and maybe to finish off, I'll, I'll say this conjecture, which I, I'm, I'm a fairly strong believer in this, is that you can actually go the other ways. So in the finite case, the RSK correspondence is a bijection. Um, and we believe that in the limit, this is also the case. So in other words, you can 
almost surely reconstruct the entire directed landscape on a strip from zero to one from a single airy line ensemble B. And my feeling is that this is really what's underlying the fact that we can actually, you know, construct this landscape at all, is that RSK is powerful enough that it is, uh, that one side of the RSK correspondence you can take to the limit and the bijection itself is, is fully passing to the limit. I can, sorry, yeah. interrupt you. So okay, thanks. Sorry, I, I can, <laughs> if there's a question, I can answer it or you can do it in a second. Okay, so first of all, uh, so thanks a lot. I would, uh, uh, I would uh, unmute, uh, um, I would uh, ask all people to unmute themselves in order to thank all together uh, Duncan for this nice talk. Okay, so there was a question. There is a question in the chat. If you can go two slides before uh, the slide where you, uh, with, with the picture of the excursion tree. Uh, if you can comment again uh, the, why uh, you have uh, the minima of B1 minus B2. Yeah, so I, maybe th this kind of will help explore why this last passage in the Airy Line Ensemble is interesting. So what happens out of This is B1, this is B2, and uh, say I'm looking at last passage from, uh, say I have this structure in the landscape from zero to Y. So what this structure means is that if you take a point far enough away here, so some point Z, then the geodesic from Z to Y is gonna coalesce over here. And so what this means is that you have disjoint geodesics from zero to Y and zero to Z. So you can ask at the level of uh, the airy line ensemble, what are the point, what do points Y look like for you to be able to take a point Z where you're gonna see some disjoint geodesics? So, your geodesic from zero always looks the same. So this is my Y. Your, disjoint ge your geodesic from zero always just follows the top line. So what you're asking for with a geodesic from Z is that this geodesic should uh, jump right at the very end. So it shouldn't ever use that top line. And under what conditions would you never use that top line? Well, the only way you're never gonna use that top line is if you see a one-sided minimum. So there's gonna be if you see a one-sided minimum of B1 minus B2. So if you see a minimum on the left. So now I said these were not just one-sided minima, or not just one-sided local minima, but true local minima. And the reason is that um, you can also sort of play this game, not with sending Z to the right, but you can also play the game sending Z to the left. So you'll see a geodesic like this and a disjoint one over here. And the fact that you can play it sending to the left at the level of the area line ensemble, this corresponds to flipping the entire thing around. And so not only do you need a one-sided minimum on this side, you need a one-sided minimum on the other side as well. Okay, thanks. Um, so is there uh, any other question? You can... Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, so I the RSK correspondence at the limit, so you mean that we have a pathwise bijection between the B ensemble and the um, L. Is that what you mean, pathwise? Um, that, that, that is given, given, I think you said one direction holds that given the airy line ensemble B, then we can construct uh, the L. Uh, and, and the question wa was whether that was uh, invertible, is that it? Yeah, maybe I, I can say a bit more about this. So, so if, you, um, if you have your usual Usually in the finite case, you would sort of have a pair B, W, right? So B, this is what happens in the finite case. And then in the limit, 
And in the finite case, there's kind of a correspondence between B mm -hmm. and W. And then in the limits, we know what we get on this side. This is some parabolic airy line ensemble B. And over here, you get a directed landscape L. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we've shown is that almost surely you can, so. Okay, almost surely. Almost surely the joint distribution of these things is determined and you can actually reconstruct this side from L. And the belief is that almost surely you can also go back. I see. I see. So it's the other way around of what I thought. Okay. Okay. That's, um, that looks amazing. Yeah, I, yeah usually the, the way that RSK inverts in the finite case is very local. And so there's kind of no chance that the local, that the finite inversion formula passes to the limit. But we believe that, you know, there's something special going on probabilistically, which allows you a kind of completely different type of inversion formula that does work. Thank you. Thanks. Is there um, any other question? Well, I have another question about that. Yes, sir. please. <laughs> so, so, uh, so all these things happen happens with uh, Brownian motions. Would you have, um, would you know whether some of these things would be preserved if you replaced uh, Brownian motions by some other processes with independent increments? Um, I mean, of course, Brownian motion is the most natural to do it, and it comes from so, applications. But I, I mean, one one of the this is kind of one of the things that Bala was talking about is the natural the, the natural thing where all of this framework still goes through is if you look at Bernoulli random walks. Yeah. Um, but if you But I, I don't think there's any other settings where this whole framework goes through. There's somehow, um, even if you like, even if you say look at arbitrary, um, I, 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 maybe I'll say that there's something very special about uh, when the bijection, when you can sort of understand. So this RSK is always a bijection, um, but the fact that you can understand, but if you restrict your if, if you somehow put a measure on the space of paths that you're starting with, then you need to be able to understand the measure that you get on the other side. And in order to understand the measure that you get on the other side, you need something a little bit more special than just having an independent increment process that you start with. So for example, if you start with arbitrary random walks and apply this, you get some mess on the other side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, it's something special about, you know, not just Brownian motions, but uh, like one or two other integral classes of uh, these things. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. I have a question. Yes, please. Is there any chance of, of proving the metric composition law in the limit without for, for the directed landscape without uh, you know or for two airy sheets defined without referring to the original uh, to to finite models? Um. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I have no idea if I, I I have no idea how you would do that. Yeah, I, I just thinking maybe yeah. maybe your new work can can sort of shed some light to that. I don't know. Why. Um, I'm not. I haven't thought about whether the, the new stuff sheds light on on that property or not. Yeah, I mean, somehow actually, like a single airy sheet doesn't a single airy sheet doesn't contain any of these um, multi-point, uh, you know, extended landscape or extended airy sheet values. So you'd need like the entire landscape on the strip in order to see these things. Um, and in, and in fact, in some sense, it's a little bit like the airy line ensemble. So if you know the the top airy process in the airy line ensemble, then you don't then you know something about the second line, but you don't know all that much because you're still basically looking at you know a one, you're still basically looking at independent Brownian motions sitting on top of each other at least locally. Um, and I think kind of the same structure is holding for the airy sheet with these sort of extended versions sitting beneath it, if you will. Can I can I have another remark? So, is is it true that now that you can construct this kind of evolving airy line ensemble, right? It can evolve in time. Mm -hmm. Then then this uh, is is kind of the limit of, for example, the PNG process, the polynuclear growth growth process that people have 
even as a function of time with all the lines? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can do this. Uh, it, it, all of these things would. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, we we do it for Brownian last passage, but the 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 framework is you know com is robust that it will accept any integral mo integral model as input. In fact, it's you know maybe there's almost no new analysis. I will say that happens in the pre limit. You don't need any new estimates. You just need what's already been done, which is basically understanding convergence to the directed landscape and then some analysis of what's happening in the actual limit. But in the pre-limit, you don't need anything new. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there other questions? So I have a very basic question. When at the near to the end, uh, you express the property or have been uh, disjoint uh, geodesics, uh, mm -hmm. okay, in terms of an identity, but it was uh, for two pairs of points. Does it uh, work also for um, more points, more pairs of points? Yeah, you can. It, it works for any number of pairs of points. Yeah. So this is sort of. Um, it's not completely. I mean, it's sort of natural that you would expect that if the extended landscape value equals a sum of distinct ones, that that corresponds to exactly the situation when you have a disjoint geodesics. It's it's not completely obvious because there's some issue of you know, is this supremum attained? Things like that, but it's you know it, it does go through in all in all contexts. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Is there some other question? Any other question? So if not, uh, so I would uh, ask everybody to unmute himself herself to thank all together uh, Duncan and also Balik for their very nice talks. Okay, thanks a lot. So I stop. Uh...